Hello, thank you for clicking on the video for Precision Time Protocol, the basics. My name is Albert Mitchell, and for the next 10 or 15 minutes, we're going to teach you a little bit about how PTP works. Why do we even need Precision Time Protocol? We have another protocol called Network Time Protocol, or NTP, and it's very widely used. Almost all consumer devices use it, your laptops, your iPhones, they all use it. And the synchronization is to within 10 milliseconds according to the standard. And that's really good. I mean, for human beings, 10 milliseconds is enough. But there are other systems out there that need something more precise. We call them deterministic systems. And for this, they need to have less than one microsecond of precision. And if you look at that, that's a lot of zeros of precision. We're talking nanosecond levels of precision. So where is PTP used? Have you ever seen newspapers being printed? They, things are moving really fast and everything is in time. And if you ever seen like the ink is slightly off on the newspaper, that's probably because there was an error somewhere and it could have been because things got out of time. Or if you're on Wall Street, uh, trading stocks and bonds, the faster you can make a trade or synchronize your devices ac across each other to make trades within each other, the better you are and the more money you're making. Time is money to the Wall Street guys. In the electric utility systems, your power grid uses PTP uh, to synchronize the opening and closing of relays um, to deliver the power. So we're going to cover the basics here, which is going to incorporate the types of PTP profiles. And I'll get to that in just a second. And then how messaging works, how the PTP synchronization is happening. In a future video, we'll get into um, clock types and how to configure the network for different things. Just a first a basic picture, when we talk about distributing time, you have to have a time source. We call this the Grandmaster Clock. It's the source of time. And the things that are doing the work that need to be synchronized with the Grandmaster, we call these ordinary clocks. And PTP is the protocol to distribute time to these ordinary clocks from the Grandmaster. Now, if you fundamentally understand this diagram, then you will understand how PTP messaging works across a network. Okay? You don't have to know what it means right now, but we're gonna get to it. First, we need to look at this from a network level. PTP will typically operate in a smaller network within an enterprise or even something smaller, a subset of the enterprise network. It works at layer two or a layer two, layer three combination, so a small subset. And the different roles that they have are, there's one operating grandmaster, and he's signified there at the top of this diagram with a GPS antenna. GPS is a very common way to source time into your network. There are others, but GPS is the most common. And on the bottom are the ordinary clocks and the things for which we are providing time for, the ones doing the work. And in the middle are the bridges or these clocks, and they can either be in boundary clock mode or transparent clock mode. And Benefits, pluses and minuses for transparent or boundary clock will be covered in a future video. But they don't impact messaging, so we're not going to get into that here. Sadly, there's no one way for PTP protocol to work. The different industries have determined they needed PTP to operate slightly differently from the other ones. They all have their own standard. You can see there on the first row. In this particular case, there's all, each one of the 
industrial profiles. There's there's 12 profiles in that I know of. There could be more. Um, and the three that we quote unquote call industrial are the default, the power, and 802.1 AS. They each have their own standard as defined by IEEE. And you can see they, if you look at it, there's some slight differences uh, between them. But the big one that we're going to focus on that's going to show up in the messaging is the operation of the transparent clock. So there's an end-to-end -end transparent clock type and a peer-to-peer -peer transparent clock type. And different profiles will use different transparent clock types. And here's a few more differences between them. I'll give you a case to come back and, and look at this later. But let's get back to our message. So let's talk about how synchronization happens and how the ordinary clocks stay in sync. So it starts with the sync message. The sync message is essentially a timestamp from the grandmaster. Here's the current time. And the sync message gets sent out once a second or once every other second, depending upon the profile. But it's a constant sending of time. Here's the current time. Here's the current time. Here's the current time. And so that is sent at T1. And there's a two-step method that we have, which is what the Cisco products use. We, we use a two-step. And that is to account for the fact that sometimes the Grandmaster clocks have a slight delay in terms of nanoseconds often from when it takes the time source to when it's actually able to send it out. And that's just due to its own internal forwarding of time. So there's a, there's a thing called in two-step called a follow-up. So there's a, a time, a source of time, like current time T1, and then there's a follow-up message which contains when it was actually transmitted. Okay? And then it arrives at the ordinary clock at T2. So the ordinary clock gets a sync message, it takes a timestamp, call it T2, of when it actually arrived. Okay? Now, in order to synchronize with the Grand Master, it actually has to compute round trip delay because the delay between T1 and T2 is unidirectional. I need round trip. So therefore I need to request from my source of time, I need to request uh, a delay. I wanna know how far it is in the other direction. So at time T3, he'll send out a delay request to his source of time, in this case, the master clock, and the master clock receives it at T4. Now in T3, the ordinary clock will place a sequence ID for which sequence number is this delay request and a ordinary clock identifier or a clock ID. So it knows which clock it sent it to because the master clock is going to receive multiple delay requests and needs to know who to respond to. So then it will, when it gets it, it gets it at T4 and then it'll send back, okay, I got your delay request with sequence number XYZ, and I got it at T4, and he sends it back. So now, the ordinary clock knows the round, it knows the delay in each direction, and it can compute a mean path delay. And it uses that to compute the offset. The offset is how much it has to correct itself. So the ordinary clock time is not standing still in between sync messages. I mean, it continues to tick, as well as the master clock continues to tick. So what's happening is the synchronization messages are being sent once a second, and the ordinary clock is constantly computing delay round trip. And so it, with the synchronization message, as well as with the delay, it's always, it has an offset and it's always making micro adjustments on its own clock. Ordinary clocks, like anything else, um, have a crystal which determines how, what the clock, what the time is. And it's using this offset to make micro adjustments to its own internal clock to either speed it up so it catches up with the Grandmaster clock in case the crystal is too slow, or slow it down to the Grandmaster clock in case its own crystal is too fast. And all the ordinary clocks are doing this at this simultaneously. So they're always once a second, 
or whenever they receive a sync messages, updating their clock either a little faster or a little slower. But we're talking about nanoseconds here with the idea being that all the ordinary clocks stay within one or less microseconds of each other. So this is fundamentally how PTP works from a protocol perspective in terms of synchronization message and delay requests are all for the benefit of the ordinary clock so it knows how much to correct itself. We could be done right there, but there's more. Let's look at what's happening in the network perspective and why some of these delay requests are constantly having to go out. So this is a synchronization message with the two-step, which means there's going to be a follow-up message with the T1. So the synchronization, synchronization message goes out. It hits the first bridge. In this case, it's an end-to-end -end transparent clock. It doesn't matter so much in this particular case. It's going to work fundamentally the same. Synchronization message works fundamentally the same regardless of the fault or power profile, which means fundamentally it doesn't matter if you're in peer-to-peer -peer or end-to-end. -end. Every bridge that it hits, there's going to be a delay because it's going to buffer up. Right? So there's now a residence time. So the, these bridges will understand there's a residence time and when the synchronization message goes out or gets forwarded from that bridge, the follow-up message will be modified to include that um, residence time. It'll hit the next bridge, there's more residence time, and then uh, the synchronization message is finally delivered to the ordinary clock. Now, considering this is gonna happen once a second every day for the rest of the ordinary clock's usable life, the delay from the grandmaster to the ordinary clock will vary. Right? It's not when you look at any one of these bridges, the residence time is sometimes it's going to be six microseconds, sometimes it's going to be seven microseconds. It has everything to do with how busy it is. So the delay will vary, right? The ordinary clocks will not receive, you know, T2 will not always be 12 microseconds after T1, right? It just won't happen that way. So it always is computing delay, and so that's just how, it, it's, just how it's working, right? I always want to know what my delay is. If there's a change in network path, so for instance, if you're, you know, have a redundant path and you have to take it all of a sudden, um, the synchronization message will take three or four hops instead of two, right? Um, but if you compute your delay again, you can then go back and figure out, oh, now I have what well, my delay. My delay has changed, but as long as I still get the synchronization methods and I still have the delay, I'm still making the same micro adjustments to my clock. So what's this look like from across the network when we have multiple ordinary clocks being serviced by a network? Again, the synchronization starts from the Grand Master and then it's forwarded um, out all from the master facing ports to the other clock devices and then finally they all arrive at the ordinary clocks. Now what you won't see here because the animation is showing everything happening in time is the ordinary clocks will not all receive their sync message at the same time, even though it was transmitted at the same time at one time from the Grand Master. So every ordinary clock's delay will be different because things buffered differently in one transparent clock versus another, or they had more hops from one transparent clock from another. So now, in an end-to-end -end profile, such as the default profile, the delay request starts at the ordinary clock and goes to the source of time, in this case, the grandmaster. And we talked already about how the delay request has a sequence number, it's always sending delay requests, and a clock ID so that the grandmaster knows who sent the delay request. And Every delay request has a, you know, every time it hits a bridge, there's a delay called a residence time. But in this particular case, with end-to-end -end clocks, when their response comes back, the residence time is added to the response message. Again, this enables the ordinary clock to better compute delay. It knows how many hops it hit and what the delay was at each hop. That's getting a little too deep. Um, Fundamentally, you get, 
you know, a T4 at from a T3, and you can compute your delay. So if you look at it again from a network perspective, now the delay requests have to go all the way through the network. So it would fundamentally look something like this with as the delay requests start going up, they start to accumulate at these transparent clocks. And then finally you get, you know, the delay requests all hit the grand master. But they don't all, ar all arrive at the same time. It would be impossible for them to all arrive at the same time. They're all on the same interface. But if you had a thousand ordinary clocks, could you overrun your grandmaster with delay requests? You could, actually. Are there some mitigation techniques to prevent that from happening? There are, right? And it's all about how you configure your bridges to operate. And that's a teaser to get you to come back to watch the next video. So in a peer-to-peer -peer network, so there's like the power profile and the 802.1 to AS profile, things work slightly different when it comes to delay. And so the sync message is gonna work pretty much the same. I'm not showing the follow-up here, but you know, you, you get the picture. There's always a residence time. But in peer-to-peer, -peer, delay is computed between every bridge. So in a end-to-end -end profile, the ordinary clock sent a delay request from one end to the other, in other words, to the master, and then all the way back. And that's an end-to-end -end profile. In a peer-to-peer -peer profile, then every peer computes its own delay. So the, this particular transparent clock will compute its delay, and then it will use that then in as part of the correction field uh, for the synchronization method. And the ordinary clock is also computing its own delay with the upstream uh, clock. So it also has a path delay. So you get the delay from all the clocks that are in the path, um, as well as the final hop between the ordinary clock and the transparent clock. And again, it's used to compute an offset for updating its own clock. So fundamentally, it doesn't work any different whether you're in peer-to-peer -peer or end-to-end -end in terms of how the ordinary clocks update themselves. Let's recap real quick. We have this message here. It's all about T1, T2, T3, T4, computing delay from T1 and making micro adjustments. And then we know that with profiles, they all work differently. If you're having a problem with PTP in your network, one thing you could always check is, are all the devices running the same profile? If they're not, that's probably a reason why it's not working. Hey, thanks for sticking around all the way to the end. See you next time.